thank you all for being here. This event was uh, meant to be intimate, but um, the interest is uh, overwhelming, and we thought this would be a great way for you guys to get to know each other. <laughs> and I'd like to start by thanking our host, uh, Steve and Terry Hoffman. Thank you so much, Terry, for opening up your home. <laughs> and um, this, this girl here is Princess. She's uh, quite famous for obvious reasons. She actually rehabilitates the troops as they come to the sanctuary. So she lives in Liberia, and she's here to say hello to all of you. And I would recommend taking your photo with her because um, she's truly special. <laughs> so for uh, those of you who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, I'm Scarlett Magda, I'm a veterinarian. I'm the founding president of Veterinarians International. And I wanted to just give you a little bit of background of what we do. We are a global network of veterinarian, animal healthcare advocates, and community leaders that connect to remote communities to give them access to quality veterinary care for all animals, both wild and domestic. We work in an interconnected way. So how, how's that so? If you start to look at diseases, 60% of human disease comes from animals. 75% of emerging infectious disease comes from animals. You think of SARS, Ebola, bird flu, rabies, Lyme disease, these are all animal born. So we have to have healthy animals if we want to have healthy people. And looking at the environment, bless you, princess. <laughs> when we're looking at agriculture, we're clear cutting forests, which is where these diseases live. And so we need to be conscious of the implications that we're having with agriculture and all of that comes into play with, with our health here at home. Ebola has wiped out 40% of the gorilla and chimpanzee populations, but all we hear about is how many human deaths there have been. So we really need to look at health in a more holistic manner, which is why the term One Health has come up. And we actually have the gentleman who coined the term One Health here with us tonight, Dr. William Koresh. So um, our work is in many countries. It goes beyond our lovely partnership with Liberia Chimpanzee Rescue. We're in Chile and Guatemala working with families, educating them about diseases that they can get from their dogs, like rabies and tapeworm, and how being responsible pet owners is going to not only improve their pet's health, but their health as well. Rabies, rabies, 99% of rabies comes from dog bites. So if we can have children understand how to interact safely with dogs, we can reduce the incidence of rabies. In Kenya, they have a goal of eradicating rabies by 2030. So we, we work with <laughs> community organizations to provide rabies vaccines to 25,000 dogs every year. And in Asia, Asian elephants are at the brink of extinction. They're closer than the African elephant. But those who are in captivity are not having the life that they deserve. And so we're empowering communities to have better care for their elephants. So I'd like to introduce to you a very special person, Dr. William Koresh, who is the Executive Vice President for Health and Policy at EcoHealth Alliance. He is on the World Health Organization's IHR group of experts. In case you're wondering what that means, he has the ability to inform the EU about a pesticide that is killing bee populations, which is having major implications on pollination and agriculture, which we all rely on. He's also the president of the World Animal Health Organization's Wildlife Disease Group. And just last week, he published a paper looking at the economic implications of multiple sectors from 
pandemics like Ebola and diseases like Rift Valley Fever. So not only has Dr. Koresh coined the term One Health, he also co-founded Veterinarians International with me and came up with the name Veterinarians International. Um, lastly, he's published over 200 scientific papers. So in my opinion, I think he is the most important veterinarian living today. And we are beyond honored to have him on our founding board and introduce our new friend to Desmond. Please welcome Dr. Craig. <laughs> Do I, do I need the microphone? Yes, because you're recording. Oh, that's so sad. You're not supposed oh, oh, to say Thank that. you. Um, now I'm, I'm probably I'm blushing. Um, I'm, I, I know how to mix some catchy phrases. I'm not really that smart, but occasionally I come up with some phrases like that. Everybody, everybody seems to love it. was a good uh, one. It was a good one, wasn't it? It really caught on. Um, first of all, thank you for being here. Carrie, thanks for hosting us. Princess, thanks for coming for Liberia. <laughs> for a long trip. Um, I just really wanted to introduce Jim and Jenny. Um, we've worked together now for several years through uh, another organization. Um, but I think what they're doing is just a great example of One Health. And Scarlett asked me to kind of pull that together in your thinking. Um, so we're going to learn a lot tonight about the kind of the crisis of great apes and the crisis of chimpanzees. And there's a lot of moving parts to that. Um, and a lot of that is about changing landscape, changing um, habitat, deforestation, land use change. One of the biggest drivers of emerging infectious diseases, Ebola, SARS, influenza, um, most of those are linked to land use change. So if we can start doing something about how humans are affecting the planet, we can actually prevent these diseases from happening that affect people. So that's tied together. So part of Jim and Jenny's work is establishing sanctuaries in Liberia, coastal mangroves. So think about hurricane damage. Mangroves are a natural barrier. So if you cut down the, the mangroves to collect the wood and build shrimp farms, you lose all your protection in that nature has given us from storms, from tsunamis, from hurricanes. So this is kind of gets into this core concept of One Health. Is it all just about medicine, sickness, or is it about things we can do actually to make the planet healthier and make ourselves protect us and protect animals? So they're going to give a story about what they're doing and it all links together. With the baby chimps, you kind of think, well, how does that fit in? Well, the baby chimps, a lot of them are confiscated from law enforcement, from people poaching and going out. Well, Ebola outbreaks actually start from people going out and hunting great apes or finding sick great apes with Ebola, and you start a massive outbreak and hundreds of thousands of people can die. So what are you going to do about that? How do you get to the part of this is education for people to teach them not to do that, but they're also killing adult chimps so you can take the babies and sell them. Well, if you don't have a place to put the babies, Law enforcement's not going to do any law enforcement because they go, well, what are we going to do with the baby chimp? So just by establishing a sanctuary, one benefit of that, besides really making a chimp's life much better because they're left as an orphan, is it allows law enforcement to do their job. So this is where we're trying to expand this thinking about One Health, about this interconnectedness. And maybe it sounds as if I made it more complicated than it really is, but I think we all understand that the health of our planet and the health of people and the health of animals are all inextricably linked. And we at VI are trying to target in there to use that health angle to get more people to think about animals and people and the planet. So I'll finish with that. Introduce Jim, Jenny. They're shining stars from Africa. They're just a great example of the kind of people we at VI look for um, to help support. And we really need your help and your support to be able to keep funding people like them. And I'll just turn it over to you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, I'd like just to uh, reiterate um, to what Billy said. Uh, thank you so much for coming and listening to what we have to say about uh, Library Chimpanzee Rescue and uh, VI's support for us. 
Um, they really helped us last year um, with providing a lot of food and, and medical care for, for the chimps. Um, and just to give you a little background on how we ended up in Liberia, it's not like most people think, oh, well, you know, where do you want to go live? It's not, Liberia's not usually first on the list. Uh, so Jenny and I have been working in, um, in, in the field with, with great apes and, and sanctuaries for a number of years. Um, and there was a crisis that happened with a group of um, chimps that were used in biomedical research, a research program that started back in the 70s, and um, they were used to test, to develop hepatitis vaccines. Um, and over 30 years, a bunch of research was done on these chimps, and then they were sort of put out on these um, islands in a nearby estuarine habitat and supported for a few years and then eventually abandoned during the Ebola outbreak. And so when that crisis happened, yeah, there, there was a group called, called the New York Blood Center. Some of you might have, might have heard of them. They were doing the, the research and then they eventually abandoned the chimps and essentially left them to die. They, they would have starved to death. And then what happened was uh, a, a co coalition of organizations got together, led by the Humane Society of the United States, and they hired Jenny and I to go over and sort of do crisis management. So we went for one month in uh, July of 2015 uh, to help out these chimps and get things back going more smoothly. And, um, and then of course we realized, you know, we fell in love with the project and the people and the country and the chimpanzees. And we also realized that first month that we were there that there was this whole other crisis going on with chimpanzees that were victims of the wild, illegal wildlife trade and, and the bushmeat trade. So all those old chimps you just saw on the, on the video, all those guys were, um, you know, their mothers were killed. Baby chimps don't just wander out of the forest. People don't just, you know, the mothers, the mothers are very protective and the babies are very, very dependent on the mom up until about age five. And especially up in the first couple of years, they barely, first year, they're in physical contact 24 seven. And then within the first up to three, they barely venture more than a few feet away. Um, so someone kills the mom, at least the mother, and then maybe other people in the family. And then it's for meat, you know? Um, and then someone tries to sell the baby. So they go into, some people buy them as for pets, or there's also an actual, an international trade, a live trade in, in live animals. Um, which we're trying to understand more about in Liberia. Um, so anyway, there was these two little baby chimps there when we first arrived that first month, and that was the beginning of us starting this organization. And now we have 36. So we're getting about one a month. Um, and uh, like Billy pointed out, you know, all this, it's all linked together. Um, the, or these orphan chimps, they're victims of this trade. There's people out hunting them. Those people are putting themselves at risk. Um, of contracting diseases, potentially from the chimps or other animals that they're hunting. Um, and before we came to Liberia, the, the government would not confiscate chimpanzees because, like Billy said, there was nowhere to put them. So the primary role of the sanctuary is to provide a home for the chimps. So it's an animal welfare thing first, um, but just below that it is conservation because by having the sanctuary there, we support law enforcement, we help build capacity in the government to build, to, to enforce the law. And that way we're protecting the wild chimps. So the long-term goal is to protect the chimps in the wild. Because at the end of the day, that little Max guy that Jenny was holding, you know, he's growing up right now. He's about two and a half. And um, we, I, I love Max. We both love Max. Um, he's an amazing, hmm? um, he's an amazing little guy, but, uh, I wish I'd never met him because he should be in the forest, you know, with his family. So um, I'll let Jenny take over over here and talk about some of the, the other things we're doing, and um, and then we can have questions and answers, and we can talk about our plans to build the to build the, the sanctuary. Um, thanks, everybody. My first thing I want to say is just a huge thank you to everybody in this room, Scarlett. I mean, you and Vets International, Billy. I mean. The, been an immense help to us and um, financially and also just the support that comes from people who care about what you're doing when you're out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and also thanks to everybody here for being here tonight. Really appreciate everybody coming out. Um, and just all your support. I mean, it's, it's incredibly important to us and um, 
for the project and also just personally. So thank you very much. And thanks to our hosts for having us here. It's a beautiful place. Um, and I won't go too much. Jimmy kind of gave some of the general ideas of some of the background. So I'll just let you know a little bit more of what's currently happening. Um, so right now, as Jimmy mentioned, we have 36 chimps. Um, I just got a report yesterday. Well, we have a list of uh, additional chimps needing rescue. Uh, but just yesterday, uh, I think I told Scarlett, I just got a report of an expat working as a missionary in uh, Liberia who has a chimp and is showing around on Facebook her pet chimp and how great it is to have a pet chimp. So um, that kind of thing. Oh, it's nice and dark in here. I can talk in the dark. Um, <laughs> it's okay, Prince. I'm still here. Um, but that kind of thing is... Um, that's, sorry, I'm watching Princess go out the door. I'm right here, Princess. Come here. Come on. Um, right here. There we go. Um, so, you know, that kind of thing is something we still battle. And so the people who we get the chimps from, um, you know, uh, often people will ask us, how do we get these chimps? Why are they out there? Um, Jimmy touched on it. Billy touched on it. Um, the chimps are victims of the bushmeat and, and live pet traits, um, generally. Every chimp we have has been um, confiscated from the situation. Every chimp we have is an orphan. Uh, we just got a 13-year-old chimp, um, so you may not think of him as an orphan, but he is, because he was orphaned as a baby and kept as a pet, and everybody loved him when he was little. And um, according to the people, he uh, was, you know, they cut, start, you see, they're rambunctious. At a, quite a young age, they start getting into things and breaking things, and you know they're they're being chimps. Um, if they're in the forest, it wouldn't be an issue, but when they're in someone's house, they don't like it. Um, so those chimps end up in chains and in boxes and in cages. And Johnny, who we just rescued, is 13, um, had been chained to a tree from about here to there um, for 10 years. Oh God. Yeah. So some of these stories are crazy, and um, so. Our primary goal with the chimps who come in is their care and welfare, and we will give them lifetime care. So that's our biggest challenge in terms of our day-to-day -day operations. Um, these chimps live to be 50 or 60 years old. Hopefully, they'll stay healthy, and we'll keep them healthy with your help. Um, and they'll live long, nice, wonderful lives. Um, we have a new forested land uh, space that's in the mangroves, which the picture was up there. Uh, we are relocating because where we are now is a very, very temporary location. So um, besides the care and welfare, we're trying to provide these chimps with a wonderful future in a semi-natural environment. And I'm sure we can talk about, if people have questions about um, whether they can go back to the wild um, when we're finished. But um, so the care and welfare and the day-to-day -day process is a lot of work. It's challenging. Um, chimps stay with their moms till they sleep with their moms in the in the same nest till they're about five or six. And all of our chimps, except for two, are under the age of five or six. So as you can imagine, they require quite a lot of care. Um, so that's our biggest need. Um, our second biggest need is to find them more space and build our sanctuary. And I do want to just touch, I don't want to be too redundant, but I do want to touch on the fact that um, our approach is one health and interconnectedness of everything. and. The, the health of everybody, because if our chimps stay healthy and we're able to come in and do law enforcement and work with communities and change some of the ways people think and, and change behavior um, in the way people deal with the forest and the habitats and their natural resources in Liberia and West Africa, um, and we can collaborate with organizations like Vets International and other organizations who do this kind of conservation work, um, we can not only help the chimps who, are, who you see there, but we can help wild chimps, which is our ultimate goal. Um, and everybody here, I'm sure, has heard the term ambassador species um, or flagship species. We consider chimpanzees to be a flagship species. So it, what that means is if you protect the chimps, you're protecting everybody in their habitat, which means you protect also the humans and, and the people who live in the nearby communities. Um, so I think what we do is day-to-day welfare and long-term conservation and the one health and interconnectedness of everything is really critical approach that, that we've chosen to take and I think it's critical to um, the success of the project. 
and hopefully we can make some big changes in Liberia and West Africa and, and some global changes as well with all these kinds of collaborations. I'm really excited to have people like you guys interested and, and wanting to learn more. So I, what I really generally like to do is give that background and then ask for questions because I know you, I won't answer all the right questions without asking you guys, so. Okay. Those are all very good questions. Um, for the first question, we, that's a good question. We try, my goal is always two to one, two caregivers to, for, uh, two, two caregivers for each chimp, which means two chimps to each caregiver, which yeah. means, sorry, I wish I had two caregivers for each chimp. Um, I would be a lot, I would get a lot more sleep. Um, no, one, so basically what, what happens with the chimps, that's kind of a little bit of a complex question, but um, chimps in the wild would be one-on-one -on -one with their mothers. Um, and the first year they won't even go off their mothers or, or they'll always be touching or clinging to their mothers. So when we get them, especially when we get them under that age, um, they really need one-on-one -on -one care. So uh, it, it, ideally you'd have one chimp, one human, but of course that's not always realistic. So what we try and do is make sure that Every chimp is bonded with two different humans. Um, usually we're one of, <laughs> one of those people. Um, and then we also make sure that we have enough caregivers on site so that the, there's all kinds of people there to, for them to go to and they can kind of pick and choose who they, who they prefer. Yes, so, so chimps get 24 seven care. Um, any baby who comes in generally first comes in to us for kind of crisis intervention until they stabilize. Um, we do quarantine because, of course, um, a chimp can come from the wild and bring a disease in, and, and that disease could be fatal to all of our other chimps because it could be a disease they got from a human uh, strain that, the chimp, that other chimps have never seen. So we do some quarantine. Our quarantine needs to be facilitated. Um, that's something that's a wonderful thing that we can work with with you guys, too, which is a health, a health issue is developing our quarantine facilities. Um, but yes, they need one-on-one -on -one care, 24-7 care. Um, they sleep with us until about the age of two or three. It really depends on the chimp and their personality. So we basically have a nursery school. Um, it's kind of pre-nursery, then we have a nursery, then we have a kindergarten, or you could say nursery, kindergarten, first grade. Um, and our chimps, since they're all quite young, we only go really up to a first grade. And that's when they graduate into a group of chimps. They still have caregivers all day, every day. Um, but they sleep at night together without humans in, in, the, in their areas. They have blankets and they get their bedtime cereal and they go to sleep and then the caregivers leave and we have caregivers on the outside just for security purposes. Um, so yeah, it's, a, it's, it's an extremely intensive care process, um, more than any other being I've ever cared for, including humans. Um, you know, you don't put them down I mean, you don't walk away from them. You don't put them in a car seat and walk away. You don't put them in a crib and go walk away. Um, you could do that, but you basically they'd be screaming. So that's the problem when we get them. A lot of times they're extremely traumatized. They've not only lost their families, but they've also been living with humans in conditions like being tied up so that they don't follow people around and they're not screaming. So they've learned to not trust humans. So we kind of try and nurture them back into trusting us. And we're happy the days when they when they don't want us to leave and when they start crying. So um, long answer to your one question, and I've already forgotten your second question. There's the cost and the uh, surrogate Yes, so that we don't really have older chimps yet, but um, our five and six year old chimps are starting to show some of those mothering skills, the females. So um, the girls, so we have Gway, Sweet Pea, and Portia are three oldest first girls we got and now we've added Peggy in there um, and those chimps will so when now when the younger ones come in it's really lovely to see because sometimes those those girls will go over and scoop them kind of up and throw them on their backs and walk around with them in fact to the point where some of the chimps the babies are saying no 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 I want to go meet some new people I don't want to only be with you so um, what we hope is that over time as our chimps grow and our families 
get bigger and the dynamics are, are solidified, that we will have chimp surrogate mothers versus humans. Um, it won't be in all cases, but ideally we would have chimps who mother and want to mother the chimps who come in. And so it's a more natural process. And as for costs, I'm going to hand it over to him because he's the money person. I can say it's a lot. I think I'm just better with numbers <laughs> than Debbie. Um, but it is funny, the thing about uh, the, the older females is um, they really, they're like big sisters, you know? So they, they'll, you'll see them going around and they protect and actually it causes problems sometimes because they'll kind of fight yeah, over the argue babies. Yeah, they'll sometimes over. Like, they'll, like I, I, mean, want, I want this baby <laughs> and, you know? Um, but it is nice to see that because really that's what we want. I mean, we take care of them because they don't have a family. Um, but we really want them to be with the other chimps. You know, that's where they should be. Um, and so once we integrate them into the larger group, um, it's definitely it's definitely better for them. They just need the nurturing from, from the get-go. Now in terms of costs, um, right now our operational costs are about $150,000 a year, you know, for everything. We estimate about I don't know, somewhere between five and eight thousand dollars per chimp, you know, depending on their age and how much they're eating. Um, just to give you a sense of what things cost like per month, it's about three thousand uh, to thirty-five hundred um, dollars for food alone. Um, about five thousand or so for staff salaries, and then maintenance and fuel for the vehicles and all that kind of stuff. Um, legal fees, you know, just the general admin kind of stuff. So I think we're at about Twelve thousand a month um, operationally. I'd have to. Have to I mean, we keep getting chimps, so it keeps bumping up. So every time we get more chimps, we have to hire another caregiver or two, and that becomes complicated because, like Jenny said, we want them to bond to only. It's complicated because they they should be with one person, but we can't have only one person because you can't have someone working twenty four seven, which we have we do ask people to do. <laughs> and I call it house arrest. <laughs> and. Uh, so we have usually two people, um, and then the chimps themselves, you know, they want to be only with one, and so even though it'd be easier from a like a human resource management to have multiple the chimps go to multiple people, they only trust certain people, and so you can't force them. So our 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 attitude is always to you know we we want to do what's best for the chimps, so we never force the chimps to do to do anything. Yeah, and I think um, talking about the 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 intensity and, and the, um, the care, from the care standpoint, if you, if you ask the chimps to bond with too many people, which you can do, um, they don't gain that confidence. And so when you integrate them into their final group, they will not, um, they don't do as well. So even though it might sound counterintuitive, I, to me, I think of it as human children. You know, people say, oh, that's an overprotective parent. They keep, they love them too much. They keep them with them too much. I actually disagree, um, with, especially with the chimps. Giving them that 24-7 bond with you and, and letting them never cry. A chimp in the wild, I think this is really interesting. A chimp in the wild, a baby, never cries because they never need anything. They never want anything. And that, for me, that's very profound <laughs> because um, I feel like that's something that we, we try and aspire to, to have that be the case with us. Um, of course, we're getting traumatized chimps, but our goal is to not ever have them cry. Um, they should always get what they want. They should always, and, and this is something we work with with our caregivers that's really fantastic. We have a great team. But like Jimmy said, every time new chimps come in, and you know, the more work we do, the more chimps we get. Um, the numbers will continue to go up, and then we hope as we do our job and we do better law enforcement and better community and public awareness that the numbers will, of course, go down. We hope. Those chimps will be staying in the wild. We hope one day we won't be getting chimps. Um, but for now, the numbers are going up, and trying to keep up with that care is, is pretty difficult um, because we really look trying to do the one-on-one -on -one care. So it's, it's critical for them when they end up going with other chimps, they need to have that confidence. So the more bonding and nurturing we can give them, the better off they are for the rest of their lives. And we know we're going to give them a lifetime of care, so we're preparing them for that. Um, so the forested area we have will ultimately be a semi-wild natural environment. There are reintroduction programs. Um, I'm sure Billy will have a, could have an opinion on this. I, I think they're controversial to start with because you're putting chimps who have been with humans into a wild population. So you're potentially endangering the wild population. 
um, in terms of health and disease. If it has been done and it can be done, um, you have to, of course, stop the hunting in the areas. So we, we certainly wouldn't be doing it anytime soon because we know chimps are still getting hunted and killed illegally all the time. Um, but in the future, yes, of course, I mean, our dream would be for some of the chimps. They wouldn't all ever be able to go back to the wild. Um, but people think it's because they won't be able to learn, but they can. They can learn to live into the, in the wild. They need a huge space. They need an area where there aren't other um, you know, competing groups and families. They need a huge buffer from humans because they've been raised by humans. So of course, their first fallback will be to go into human populations, and that's very dangerous for them. Um, and then, of course, they need to be extremely, extremely healthy. Um, physically, to make sure they don't give anything to the populations in the wild, but also emotionally, because they need to go through that process. So what you do for a release is you create a very strong, dynamic, um, well-formed group, and so you consider that a family, and you release them all together. Um, some of them may leave that group to another group at some point, but you don't just put them with, you can't integrate them into a wild group. So you have to put them out as their own group into their own space. Um, they start going into estrus about between anywhere between 8 and 12 years old, um, but they'll probably start having babies about after 12 years old or so. So um, right now we're lucky we aren't facing that yet, but we will face that. And uh, just to answer another question that may come up is we will be very strict about birth control because um, we can't use resources uh, for new babies because we know we're going to keep getting um, new babies in, so we can't, we can't, we won't choose to have um, babies born into the group. Um, but we will not do any sterilization. Uh, we don't like to change their behavior, so we'll use regular birth control that we would use with humans, whether that's implants or birth control pills. Um, and then also, if we do one day do reintroduction, we want to make sure that the chimps can reproduce when they go back out to the wild. So, it's. It, you really have to think short term today. What do I do with this baby who just came in? And you have to think. 50, 100 years out, whether it's for the chimps in our care or wild populations or conservation, public health. So it's it's a lot of um, big picture thinking and then a lot of day-to-day 24-7 -day thinking. <laughs> We, we haven't, and in Liberia, like Jenny said, Liberia right now is not a place where it would be possible simply because there's so much hunting going on. There's not really a safe place to put chimps back in the forest. The, the IUCN, which is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, it's like the oldest, largest uh, conservation organization in the world. They've set forth guidelines on doing grade ape reintroduction, so there's a lot of um, rules that you have to follow. Um, to have an, an ideal situation. It's probably, it's never perfectly ideal, um, so you, you do your best. There's been a couple, like Jenny said, there's been, I think, two or three attempts to do sort of reintroduction programs of, of chimpanzees with varying success. So, um, Liberia does have a, a, a chance for that because it has the, um, just, just a little background, they have chimps, uh, Western chimpanzee is a subspecies um, that we work with, and these chimps have, um, their population has declined by 85% in the last 20 years, and that's crazy. So they're a very rare group of people <laughs> who we're working with. So we wa obviously want to, um, of course, we care about them as individuals, but also we want to make sure they would go into a safe environment if we did do that. But Liberia does have the largest remaining um, habitat, co connected habitat for Western chimpanzees. So. There's a lot of opportunity there in the future. If we do things right and strategically, um, I think reintroduction is, is a possibility. Yeah, just to give you a sense of, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll answer your question in a minute. But um, so Liberia, you know, West Africa, uh, it's called the, 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 the large forest that used to be there was the Ghanaian tropical forest. And um, it's been reduced about 85, 90% over the past, you know, since over the last century, essentially, but a lot more over the past um, 30 years. Um, and so Liberia itself is a really, really important country for conservation because right now they still have 43% um, forest cover. And it's the only place left in West Africa that has large tracts of intact forest that is connected. 
um, which is super important for all species, especially elephants, that move around a lot because they, a lot of times you get these fragmented forests and you can't move between spaces. So right now the situation is good. And I think that's why the One Health approach is so important for Liberia. And I, when I give talks in Liberia, I talk about this a lot because um, they have an opportunity right now if the government does things right, if they do responsible development, do things in a way different than people have done in the past, instead of cutting down forests or, or logging concessions and then putting up oil palm or rubber plantations or whatever, um, they can maybe do it in a more responsible way where, of course, there's going to be development. You know, there, of course there will be. But if you can do it in a way that's a little bit different where people can benefit, there can be jobs, but also protect a lot of forests that then keeps the communities healthier, the forests healthier, and the animals healthier, that would be a lot better. And we also talk a lot about um, the opportunity for ecotourism in the country. Right now, people, when they think of Liberia, they think of Ebola, they think of Charles Taylor and child soldiers and blood diamonds. Right, that's what they think of in civil war. So it's not a place that people are thinking about going. But you know, five, ten, twenty years from now, it could be the only place in West Africa that still has a lot of wildlife left, and people will go to see the wildlife. And so um, I think we have a really, really great opportunity to have a positive impact on the country, um, just with our little project. You know, it's a kind of a, a microcosm of. Of, of the bigger picture of things that can happen in the country. So, yeah. Well, you partially answered my question. I was wondering whether the government was supportive of your mission at all, and whether the local community was supportive of your mission. Um, yes, we are really fortunate. Um, we've lived in several places in Africa, and um, we found this to be the most receptive place. I think partially because, as Jimmy said, there's been a civil war, there's been an Ebola crisis, there hasn't been a lot of development. So people are hungry for training and capacity building and change. And um, so we have a really unique opportunity to go in there. All of our whole team is Liberian and they're from the community. So we're very welcome in the community. The land we just leased and purchased um, at where we're moving, uh, that community is very excited. We, we, we purchased that from that local community jobs will be there, we'll bring ecotourism there, and of course awareness is the opportunity for, for awareness and education and, and all that, and, and employment is, is immense. Um, we're working globally and collaboratively uh, with not just NGOs, but also with the authorities. Um, the wildlife authorities, um, one of my big interests, um, and obviously something that impacts us is law enforcement, and the wildlife and authorities have been very excited because we've created a law enforcement committee and task force. And we're creating the first wildlife confiscation unit that has ever been uh, even thought of in Liberia. So not only did we give them the idea, but we're bringing in funding for that and we're actually developing it and creating it. So um, they're, they're very excited. I mean, we always face the challenges, of course, of balancing the, we're coming in to do this versus working with you and doing what you guys want. And um, we're fortunate that those things align in Liberia for the most part. So I think we have a really great opportunity there to do that. And um, we've seen a great response from the community. Um, and you know, it's really important for us to, um, one thing I always say to our caregivers, would they, you know, they can't, once they've had these babies, I mean, they're their babies, they can't understand, they just, oh, how could someone eat them? How could someone kill them? You know, and they call them, they say they're just like real humans. Not just like humans, but real humans. <laughs> so we always have the motto, we say they're just like real humans, um, which they are. But one thing that's really nice about that is in addition to, to, to kind of changing that way of thinking and, and having those, those are the people who need to spread that information out, not us. Um, but they also will say, you know, I think it's it's changing people to to understand that that the poachers and the and the traffickers are stealing from. It's not just us who care about the chimps or care about wildlife. They're stealing from their neighbors. So I always say to them, so this guy who's out there killing those chimps and those dikers and those, um, you know, taking parrots and selling them overseas. You know, he's getting all those things for free out of the forest, and he's working with the big guy up here who's making a lot of money. And are you seeing any of that? So, you know, I think once you kind of 
come up with these things, I think people really understand it and they and they feel it. And so what our goal is to get the community to be the people who are fighting the fight. So uh, is it the community that brings you the chimpanzees? Yes, in fact, th that was my next point is that it's it's evolved. Um, when we first came there, um, some expats had, had con well, they kind of confiscated a couple chimps. Um, those were our first two chimps. But it's come to the, um, right before we left, this is to me a real success story and I think it's great for all you guys to hear too because it, it really shows you what what's happening with us and, and what you can do and I think everybody here is a real believer in, in the ability to um, affect change. And right before we left, unfortunately we got five chimps in four days. Um, not from the same place, all from different places, which was insane. I mean, for us at, at a care level was crazy. Um, but the great news was those chimps were not, I'm generally the one reporting. I get a report from someone, it could be a community person, could be an expat, someone like that, um, or just someone I see on the street. But we, th those five chimps were all reported to me by the authorities and they asked me to come with them to go do the confiscations which is a huge turning point for us. Um, it means law enforcement is asking us, they want to do the work. And as long as we can support them in doing that, they wanna do it. And as Billy and Scarlett both mentioned, um, it's not just about getting those chimps into our care. Um, the ability to get those chimps means those guys can call me, they can do their jobs, they can enforce the law, and therefore they're stopping the hunting of chimps ultimately and other wildlife in those protected areas. So um, it's it has a huge conservation impact. And we have time for like two questions. Um, do you want to have another one? No, it's just about the government because I think it's so important for any group um, to have the support of government because they could do so much and ultimately um, education and culture takes a long, Yeah, we, we have we we have a public aware we have some public awareness campaigns that are going out, but also we're we are um, expanding our work with children's and children and schools. Um, our new site once we move there, it'll be fantastic because it opens all whole new doors of being able to host visitors and school groups and um, going out into the communities. Um, our confiscation unit. It sounds like all we're going to do is confiscate, but the confiscation unit also has an education component, of course. Um, we will hope that everybody in that unit is going out into the communities. We'll have mobile units and field units who are going out, not just confiscating, but also educating and, and asking people what they need and what, how can we help and what's going on in your communities and what are the issues and, and how can we address those. So yeah, it's critical. Can I just interject because they're also being very um, modest <laughs> in some days. And so, and we do a lot of work over in Liberia so we go over there, and, I, and I've worked in almost 50 developing countries over the last 40 years, and I meet a lot of wildlife conservation, wildlife health people. Most of them aren't real, like them, and most of them are not integrated in with the local communities and the government. So these are the real deal. When we sent a team over a few weeks ago, um, they got us in the office with the vice president of Liberia. So this is like they're they're that integrated and that respected and that appreciated. And you don't find that in many developing countries around the world where you end up with the vice president or the president's office or the secretary of health or the secretary of law. And, um, and I think it's just because they're just, the, the way you build relationships and the way you have so much respect for the people you work with, it, it pays off. So it's an amazing opportunity in Liberia that you don't see in many places. And just to uh, remind you guys of what capacity we're dealing with, Jimmy is the only veterinarian for the entire country of Liberia. Um, there's no vet school in Liberia. So uh, we're talking about major seed planting for future health care that is literally happening right here in this room. So um, I just wanted to to, like let you guys know how interesting this situation is. And I think it's poignant that Donnie Moss asked the last question because 
This whole situation happened because in 2014, the New York Blood Bank abandoned 66 chimpanzees that they were doing AIDS and hepatitis research for. Donnie Moss is the gentleman who led a campaign to save those 66 chimps. And so we have some, yeah, yeah, you definitely tell them how important Donnie is. So um, Donnie's been allowed to ask, ask the last question, and I really want you guys to have the opportunity to talk to us and um, you know, get to know us and, and, and socialize a bit. So Donnie, go ahead. So uh, you moved into a house in Liberia to take care of chimpanzees who were 66 chimpanzees who were living on islands, nowhere near your house. Right. Yet yeah. you have in your care now 36 chimpanzees and human caregivers living with you. And so what are the conditions in which you're living now and how urgent is it that you move to this new site that we saw? Uh, thanks, that's a good question. Um, so Donnie's been there, so he, he knows the answer to this, but so it's a trick question. Uh, no, um, thank you, Donnie. By the way, just I want to reiterate what Scarlett said. Donnie is the reason, a big reason why we're there and doing this, um, and has been an amazing support. So uh, it, we live in a house at, so the, the, where they did the former, the research with the the former research with New York Blood Center is the location where we're living. So we're still at this laboratory. It's very odd. It's <laughs> eerie, actually. Some of the old cages that the chimps lived in are there, and it's it's creepy. Um, but it's free, so we're squatters. So it is <laughs> very important and, and urgent that we move. Um, when we first got there, it was already urgent because, of course, you don't want to be living as squatters in a house with chimps everywhere, and it's just not appropriate for the chimps or for anybody else. Um, but now we have 36, and we are literally bursting at the seams. I mean, literally. We, we do not have space. We, have, we are at the point um, when we left. Jimmy was sleeping in one room with two chimps. I was sleeping with four chimps in another room. Downstairs were eight chimps with two other caregivers, or three other caregivers and another chimp in another room. So every bit, every corner of our house is filled with babies um, because they do need to, those are all the ones who need to sleep with someone at night. Um, we're up to about 13 or, I think 13 or 14 now who sleep in our house. Um, 15. Okay, it keeps growing while we're gone. We've gotten two since we're gone and I think we'll get another one tomorrow. So um, yes, it is extremely urgent. Our new location, uh, the first phase of development is um, just to get our essential buildings in there. A, a house, a nursery, um, some food prep, and uh, a, a small quarantine area. And, and then we have 100 acres and a whole, well, the most important building, 100 acres of forest. And right next to that, we will be building a big holding facility, which will be really nice. It'll be basically a night dorm. So the chimps will go out into the forest every day. Um, it's going to be life changing for them and for us. <laughs> um, we will be out of the house and we'll be in a forest. And the chimps, I keep telling our caregivers, um, and this is how I can end it, is, um, is that we now have built a lot of enrichment and platforms, and there are ropes everywhere, inside the house, outside the house, tire swings, um, all kinds of things. I mean, tr pretty much all day we do enrichment because we need to keep them busy and fulfilled and excited and happy. Um, I keep telling caregivers, when we get to the forest, we won't need any ropes. We won't need any caregiving. We won't need anything. All you have to do is walk out with them, and they'll go up in the trees, and you guys will just be able to chill out and be there for them when they need to eat and get cuddles. So, so I just want to add, add one thing, because um, it's been so nice that, first of all, that you guys hosted us here, and that um, BI has been helping us last year and plans to help us in the future. And <clears throat> the role, our relationship that we have with Vets International, um, I think there's a ton that we can do together. With the sanctuary, but also when you were talking about the rabies stuff, uh, yeah. you know, we are already involved in, in doing uh, work on rabies in Liberia. So, and the, the capacity that needs to be built within the country to, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of people in Liberia who love animals and want to work with animals, and they don't have a, there's no avenue for them to do that. So, there's a lot of stuff that we can do together to help build the capacity in yeah, the country. Yeah, I mean, paravet training, I mean, rabies vaccination programs, all of that stuff. We've set it, we've set up um, LCRP to be a, a center for all of that. So we don't, we, we're not only doing chimps. And so I think this is a really fantastic um, relationship now and, and into the future. I think it's got so much potential and it's exciting. Yeah. And we're thank, very thankful. <laughs>
Um, and so just to give you a sense of the, the buildings and our plan for building the infrastructure and how much it's gonna cost, um, we need to raise, for the first four core buildings, we need to raise probably about a million dollars. We probably get about 300,000 right now. Um, so we can get started. And then um, the next phase, we're gonna be coming to VI to help us build the vet clinic. We don't need that right at the beginning, but we're gonna need it after in the quarantine facility. So that'll be coming in, in the next year. So, um, uh, yeah. We haven't costed that out yet, but I'm guessing it's gonna be around it's probably going to be around two hundred thousand dollars, probably about for the quarantine. Maybe half that. Um, that's just a, a guess, um, but I, I think that's fairly close. And ed it's an educated guess. Um, so, um, so all in for infrastructure development is probably like three to three and a half million. And then um, you know, once we're up in full full capacity, where we're really doing all these programs with the public awareness and stuff, it's probably going to cost us about a quarter million dollars a year operationally going forward. Um, and at that point, you know, hopefully we're raising lots of money and then we'll try and build an endowment way down the road so that we can do it in perpetuity. Because chimps lived for, you know, decades, over 50 to 60 years. So this is a very, very long-term project. Um, so we're very excited about working with Vets International and we're so excited you guys came to hear us talk about uh, the work we're doing in Liberia. And everyone's welcome to come and visit if, if they want to. and the in the dry season, uh, it's a it's a really interesting place. So, um, thank you very much. Thank you. So, I just wanted to to close by um, letting you know that our goal for this year for Vets International is, is seven hundred thousand, and we're hoping that you can help us um, get there or, or spread the word to help us get there and help organizations like LCRP. There's two people I just wanted to point out to you, uh, Christina Blaustein, she's our um, development chair, and Nancy Young, our um, acting managing director. And the two of them, I highly encourage you to talk to about getting involved and how you can help make a difference. And I invite you all to uh, come out and have a drink and a snack. And please don't forget your little gift bag from us on your way out. Thanks for coming. Yeah.